Uh, so we're going to go on and talk about uh, C12 fixation. I'd like to acknowledge my current fellow, Coy, who helped me um, put some slides together for this. Uh, and I have disclosures. They're here. Uh, I think this is a CME course, so um, we're obligated to disclose. Uh, I do some work with uh, DePue and Globus and some publishing work. Uh, so we talked about um, causes of high cervical myelopathy and instability. Um, and you see, you've seen some very common indications for that between uh, what Eric showed you and what uh, Michelle showed you. Um, for those of you who are seeing things like uh, those guidelines, uh, things that uh, Michelle showed, uh, a lot of the upcoming questions on your written boards will be pulled from there. So I would strongly suggest you actually look through and at least memorize the little boxes that come like that because um, it's likely to come up later on. Uh, and at the end of, of our day today, after Mike Wang speaks after me, uh, we are going to have a little oral board style question and answer session. So um, uh, we talk about some of these fixation options at C1, C2. Um, there is uh, options including wiring. Uh, there's clamping, there's a transarticular screw fixation, and then there's a C12 goal harms technique. Um, and we'll review each of these uh, as well. And these things are also, again, likely to show up in the future uh, and things that you should probably know for exam type things. So, uh, C12 clamps, these were used when I was a resident, um, which has been some time ago now, uh, in the 90s. Um, so, uh, basically, they're not great in rotation. Uh, requires the laminate to be intact, so largely are not utilized nowadays. Um, I've seen maybe just two in the last 10 years of someone trying to do this, uh, and they were both from outside the U.S. Um, what are the types of C1, C2 wiring? So uh, Brooks starts with a B, gets bilateral separate wiring, so that's easy to remember. Uh, galley is pictured here. You get a piece of bone graft put on the back of the arch of C1, and then you wrap it around C2, and Sontag uh, put the piece of bone in between C1 and C2, and then squeezed it. And uh, so this is why Michelle was showing you those other pictures, because that's where you get your fusion. It's all well and good to put your screws in, right? If you don't get a fusion, then what happens to the screws over time? In the green shirt. Non-union, that's right. So then your hardware will become loose if you don't get a fusion. This is why we incorporate bone graft often between C1 and C2 lamina. Now, if, you're, if you do not have a lamina of C1, so you had a Jefferson's fracture next to you in the dark shirt, what's a Jefferson's fracture? It's a fracture of C1, the break in the ring, the way the anterior and posterior is part of C1. Okay, if you have that fracture, can you do one of these wiring techniques? So where are you going to put your bone graft? You wouldn't be able to do a wiring have to do a Yes, you could not do a wiring, but you could put screws. So where would you put your bone graft to support your fusion? More laterally. Laterally where? into the facet, okay. So uh, what's between you and the facet when you're doing a posterior approach? There's a structure in between you and there. Uh, no, that's not the structure. Uh, next to you in the pink shirt. C2 nerve root. Okay, so what do we do if we want to pack bone graft into the joint? You can, uh, you can take the nerve root. Okay, and then you could pack bone to the joint if you took the nerve root, that's fine. Uh, if you take a nerve root out of curiosity, would you take it before the ganglion or after the ganglion, and why? Okay, let's ask the person next to you there. Uh, Josh from USF. Uh, which would you guys take it after the ganglion? No, you take it before the ganglion. Uh, otherwise, you can set up, just as you said, in theory, a neuropathic pain syndrome. Okay, so we can also do mogrel screws. Probably uh, Rusty and Pat are the only two in this room who still use that technique. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> 
since they uh, probably were the only ones facile enough to do it for so many years. Uh, most of us have moved away from this because there is a blind pass between the C12 joint and you can hit the vertebral artery rarely. So if you choose this technique, you need to really investigate where the vertebral artery is and if there's anatomic variation in it. What is the advantage of using this technique versus the goal or harms technique? We're going to ask there in the striped shirt. I'm not certain. There is an advantage. It's very important in today's day, day and age too when we talk about cost. And that the advantage is that you can get the thing done with two screws rather than four and two rods, plus set screws. So in, um, in other countries, when I go and, and visit, I often will see them using Mogrel's technique with the transarticular screws because it's cheap and it's very effective. And then they'll supplement with wiring. Plus it's the one technique that captures four cortical layers of bone. That's right. Four cortices. What are those four cortices? Let's ask right behind you, Rusty, here in the check shirt. Uh, it would be the, um, so the outer cortex uh, where you um, enter uh, on the uh, C2 surface. Okay. And you're going to get the uh, articular surface of C2, superior articular surface, and the inferior articular surface of C1, yep. and the uh, anterior cortex of C1. Very good. Excellent. Okay. So uh, if you hit the vertebral artery on one side, which side, by the way, do you think you should do first um, here in the glasses? Uh, Andrew, from UCLA, uh, go for the non-dominant side. Okay, which side is that usually? It's usually on the right. Usually right. Okay, good. If you do hit it, don't go to the other side. You can, and, and I, you know, I say this, but there are patients who they hit on both sides. You hit on both sides, that's deadly. Um, that's massive posterior fossa stroke. You hit it on the non-dominant side, there's a reasonable chance they may not have a deficit at all if they have a kind of, you know, patent circle of Willis. So um, very important to think about that. So this is the anatomy of the vertebral artery. Here it's coming off the subclavian. It goes into the foramen transversaria. Which foramen transversaria does it typically enter first next to you there? C6, I'm right. Yeah. Yep, good. And, and sometimes it can enter in C7, so we have to think about that too when we put lateral mass screws in C7, for example. Uh, if you look at the distance from the vertebral artery from the midline, it's very important if you're doing transoral odontoidectomy. Um, so at the level of C2, it's 14 millimeters from the axis. At the level of C1, it's 22 millimeters from the axis. So if you're doing a transoral and you have a one centimeter little paper ruler, and you drop it there and you stay in the middle, then you're not going to be far enough, wide enough to be hitting the vertebral artery. So it's important to note that. So this is the path of the vertebral artery. Um, and that is the position of the what screw uh, right there with the beard. I'm uh, Andy from Iowa. Um, so that's the starting point of the transverticular screw? Yes, that is correct. And it is also the starting point of another screw. Uh, screw. That's correct. OK, good. Next to you there in the red, that is the starting point of a? C2 medical, Andy from Northwestern. OK, good. And then next to you, that is the nerve root. Uh, which you would have to go through that to get to the facet joint to pack it full of bone and that of course is C1 entry point and what entry point is this? That's right, that's a translamer entry point. Very good. Alright, so if you see CT scans of axial cuts that look like this, you do not want to do a parse screw because that vertebral artery sitting in the middle of the pars. You probably don't also want to do a, a transarticular screw because you might have problems with that. If you see subluxation like this and you're going to do a malgral type screw, you don't want to do that because it's not reduced and you can even see that this person has the vertebral artery sitting at C1 right in the pathway of where you might want to go. So it's very important to look for aberrations in the anatomy um, and figure out if there's going to be something in your way. Um, this is why the C1 lateral mass screw was thought of, initially reported by Gold using little plates and small screws, and then, and then Melcher and Harms talked about using rods and polyaxial screws uh, afterwards to make it a bit easier. So um, we all talk about you know, all kinds of fascinating anatomy of the thalamus. You know, there's 15 different lines that come here and there. But if we talk about 
the fascinating anatomy of C1, C2, there's plenty to be known there too. Um, so here you can see all the, all the little grooves and things. This is a very important groove to, uh, to know about. What's this in this groove here uh, with the glasses there? That's right. That's the vertebral artery. So you're looking at this C1 from the top down. So the vertebral artery comes out of here and then courses here and will sit right there before it enters into the foramen magnum to form what? The two vertebral arteries joined together to form the same person. Basilar artery, right, okay, good. And then you can look at the lateral masses. Here's the anterior tubercle of C1. This is very important to look at the shape of C1 because if you're putting a C1 lateral mass screw and you put the screw there and on the lateral fluoro, you line it up so it's at the front tip on the lateral fluoro of the anterior tubercle of C1, then a lot of the screw will be extraneous into the soft tissue here. And what structure sits right here next to you there? Carotid. That's right. So you go a little too deep and you hit something else red that you weren't thinking about. So when you do this on C1 lateral mass screw on the lateral floor, you want to stop your screw at the back of the tubercle of C1 and not come out too far anterior. This is the side view of the C1. Uh, again, the vert comes out of here, swings over, and sits in the sulcus arteriosus and then comes up into the form of magnum. It's very important to notice where that vert is. And if you're taking a bovi and you're exposing C1, you don't want to take your bovi on the top surface of C1, otherwise you're going to meet something red that you don't want to meet. So this is intraoperative um, basic anatomy, but you basically put your um, starting point here in the lateral mass of C1. You're going to go through uh, the lateral mass of C1 with your drill and then ultimately with your screw, and you want to stop the screw here at the posterior aspect of the tubercle on the fluoro uh, and not come too far out anterior. And uh, then you put your screw in. You do not need to sacrifice the C2 nerve root. If you are doing a wiring technique to put your bone graft in, you can push the root down and put the screw in, which is what I do. But some people take it and they pack their bone into the facet joint, and then that bone gets into here. So um, this is the um, harms variation of Gull's technique where he put the screws on rods and made them polyaxial to make it easier to line up. And again, if you do this, you don't have to sacrifice the root. You can see that you can pull the root down and then put the screw there uh, and then put the construct there and then bone graft here. What do you do for hemostasis on your C1? So I like to uh, use a little bit of gel foam or a little bit of powdered gel foam type stuff and then I pack it there when it starts bleeding and then I go to the other side. When I come back, it's usually dry. But if you keep trying to sit there and bipolar it, it can be a bit painful. Okay, um, over here in this row here, uh, question mark, the big question mark, what is that structure? This is now looking at C2 from the top down. Uh, is that the pedicle? That's the pars. Okay, what's the second question mark? Pedicle. That's the pedicle. Good. And um, which one is this? Same person. Oh, I don't know your name. What's your name? Joe. Joe. Uh, pars. Pars again. Good. So this is the difference. The pars connects the superior and inferior articulating processes. So the pars is there in green. Uh, the pedicle can, uh, basically connects the vertebral body to the superior articulating facet, by definition. So the pedicle is in red. So those are two separate structures. So when you say that there's a C2 screw, it's not interchangeable to call one a pars and one a pedicle. They're actually separate, different constructs, separate, different screw positions, and separate entry points. So um, make sure that you call a spade a spade. These are the entry points for the pars screw versus the pedicle screw. So the par screw entry point from the medial C23 facet joint is basically three millimeters up and three millimeters lateral. So that first little red dot here, there. And the pedicle screw entry point is more superior and more lateral to the par screw entry point by two millimeters because the pedicle screw is gonna go like that and the par screw is gonna go like that. So they have different entry points. 
And this is a very classic question that you might get asked later on if you were taking some kind of an exam. So here is the pictorial uh, representation of that. Par screw is number three entry point. Pedicle screw is number two entry point. You can see the differences in trajectories. And the C1 lateral mass screw is the white arrow, number one entry point. There's the pedicle. There's the pars. Uh, pictorially, again, represented here with C2 pedicle screws compared to this picture, which is C2 part screws. And you can see less lateral to medial um, than the pedicle screw. So, um, you know, we, we reviewed a lot of different techniques here. I'll show you a little surgical video of a C1, C2 um, lateral mass screw with a translaminar screw now. Um, but, you know, you can clamp it. That's really sort of falling out of favor because uh, it's not good in rotation. You can wire it. We talked about the three different kinds of wiring. So if you want to be a star, you can tell people now what the three different kinds are. And uh, you talk, we talked about Mogrel's transarticular screw. And then we talked about the C1 lateral mass screw introduced by Goal, later finalized by Harms with a um, polyaxial screw. So this is the operative view. So here you can see the Penfield 4 is pulling the C2 root down. I made a small little opening in the back of the C1 lateral mass, and I drill a pilot hole, then I tap the pilot hole. Now again, where is the sulcus arteriosus? Sulcus arteriosus is here. The vertebral artery sits here, so I'm on the bottom surface of the C1 lamina. Here's the root here being held by the pen field. Now typically this is hard cortical bone, so I usually do tap it. Um, because if you don't tap it, usually the screw doesn't want to go sit in there. Um, when you measure the screw size for this, what is the typical screw size? Uh, let's ask here with the sweater tied around you. <coughs> that's exactly right. 34 in a smaller person, 36 in a bigger person. That's a pretty long screw, and the reason is because you're leaving the head superficial to the C2 root. Um, and that's why it ends up being long. Some people put smooth shank over the C2 root. I usually thread it all the way down. I don't know that it makes much difference, but that's why it's such a long screw. So it's good to tell your scrub person before you start what two sizes of screw to have ready so they don't sit there and fumble about in the back table while things are oozing from the little plexus that sometimes sits there. Here's the translaminar screw entry point. Uh, so a little hole there. We take the gear shift, or you can use a drill. Um, the issue with the translaminar screw is if people have a big, thick neck, then the, the uh, tendency is to put the translaminar screw at a, a more steep angle, and that's where you end up in the canal. So you really got to think about on the translaminar screw that you have to end up in the lamina on the other side, and if they got a big, thick neck, it's going to be a hard screw to get. So you can practice that when you get into the anatomy lab too, and then you can put in uh, translaminar screws and uh, the other issue with the translaminar screw also is this is not my first go-to screw. This is the screw that I use if for some reason I cannot get a PAR screw or a pedicle screw in because the vertebral artery anatomy is off or someone has already tried a PAR's pedicle screw that got loose. And the reason is that there's been some instances where people have really thin bone in the pedicle and you know these screws in the back here are not crossing the instantaneous axis of rotation. And so what can happen is the pedicles can fracture and the whole posterior element complex can just be loose. So um, this is not the number one go-to technique for me. I'd rather have screws that go more anterior through the pars of the pedicle. So what do you do if you have vertebral artery injury, Dario? You, uh, leave you put in a short screw, you go to angio, you don't have to leave side. Okay, so the scrub tech hands you, um, you know, some kind of powdered gel foam stuff. Can you <coughs> shove that in there? Okay, why not? That's right. That could embolize. That could cause stroke. So if you hit it, you know you can always stick your finger in there first, stop the bleeding. But you want to get gel foam, and you want to get a patty. You don't want to put flowable hemostatic agents because they can get sucked into the vessel and cause stroke. And then that creates more of a problem than if you just had the bleeding stopped. And you could put a screw in to. Um, to uh, tamponade if you need to. And then where do you go post-op, Nathan? Angio. Angio to do what? Um, well, they, they have a couple of options, but they may need to take down the bird. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if the vert is in a location where you could get proximal and distal control, it is possible to get proximal and distal control, uh, then you could potentially try to repair it. That's not easy to do, but if it's something like this, where the vert is hit in an area of the sulcus arteriosus, then you potentially could put temporary clips and stitch uh, is another option. But for the most part, it'll get hit in a blind spot where you can't see, and so you need to figure out a way to tamponade and get them to angio. So um, I'll stop there. Um, I didn't make it all the way through the front row. Um, if any of you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to ask.